So last July, the Reverend Ann DeMichael, who's probably watching from Florida this morning, and Reverend Paula McDesey asked me to go to dinner. Not unusual, I'm on the board, board members get together with the minister, not a big deal. Well, that night was a big deal because that was the night that Paul informed me that she would be retiring from Unity Renaissance. Now, she also told me something that apparently I had said three years earlier when I stepped back on the board. She said, at the time you said, every time I get back on the board, a minister leaves. <laughs> it's usually when Ed and I are on the board, a minister leaves. <clears throat> Don't shoot the messenger. So I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked, because after all, Paula put in 20 years in her 10 plus years, or almost 10 years, that she was here, and it was really time for her to move on. So of course, right after that, you folks found out in September, and being on the board, the questions started coming at us fast and furious. We're going to consider a female minister, aren't we? We're going to strongly consider a female minister. <laughs> We're going to have a female minister, right? <laughs> and of course, it makes some sense. Think about this ministry since its very inception. Judy Myers, Pat Bessie stepped in for a little while as a transitional minister, Elizabeth Thompson, Laura Barrett Bennett, Paula McDesey. So in that sense, you know, the, the divine feminine has its imprint on this ministry, and quite frankly, unity in general. But my answer to folks would always be, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what's going to happen next. You see, 150 years ago or so, 175 years ago, thereabouts, there would not have been a Reverend Paula, or a Reverend Laura Barrett Bennett, or a Reverend Elizabeth, or a Reverend Judy Meyer. Heck, there wouldn't even be a Reverend Ann DeMichael watching from Florida today because women simply weren't ministers. So what's changed? We know that this is Women's History Month. Maybe knowing where we've been will tell us a little bit about where we're going to and whose shoulders we're standing on. I've got a couple of stories to tell you today, some fascinating stories. As I was writing this book, I delved deeply into our history, into the history of the spiritual roots of the nation. And one great story is this woman, Jarena Lee. Now, this woman was born a free black woman in New Jersey in the late 1700s. And in those days, of course, she was a member of the AME Church. Who's ever heard of an AME Church? And, oh, lots of you folks know. Yeah, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, one of the earliest black churches in America, which sewed together black history and spirituality with Christianity. And Jarena Lee would start getting these messages as a young woman that said, go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the gospel. I will put words in your mouth. So she went and she spoke with Bishop Allen, who headed the AME church, and said, I want to preach. My dear, women are not preachers. You cannot preach. Eight years later, she's sitting in the pew in a church. Brother Williams is at the helm that day, conducting the service. He's speaking, he's preaching from the book of Jonah. And Joanna Lee, in her autobiography, said that Brother Williams had lost the spirit. <laughs> Spontaneously, I took over. And oh, what a day of preaching it would become. This is what she said. When in the same instant, I sprang as by altogether a supernatural impulse to my feet when I was aided from above to give an exhortation on the very text which my brother Williams had taken and lost. I told him that I was like Jonah, for it had been nearly eight years since the Lord had called me to preach the gospel. Now she sat down immediately. She was frightened. She was trembling. This is, it, the game's over. I'm going to be kicked out of the church. And Bishop Allen got up in front of the ministry and said, I have an apology to make. This woman asked me eight years ago to be a preacher. She is filled with the Holy Ghost. Leave her alone now. Now, Joanna Lee went on to continue preaching. In fact, she became a traveling preacher, and she went to other parts of the country. Imagine a black female preacher going to other parts of the country, and especially in the South. So when they challenged her, this is what she said. 
Did not Mary first preach the risen Savior? If a man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman, seeing he died for her also? Is he not a whole Savior instead of half of one? And she went on to write the life and religious experiences of Jerena Lee, which became the very first African-American published autobiography in the nation. She also became a member of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and she passed away during the Civil War. Now, what other shoulders are we standing on today? Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of Rebecca Cox Jackson. We, we simply don't have any pictures or even any artist renditions of her. She was also a member of the AME Church. Now, we've already talked about Joanna Lee and the kinds of challenges she faced. Imagine if you were mystically inclined and you wanted to preach, but you were black, and you were a woman, and you were gay in the 1800s, even though she was a free woman. Now, Rebecca Cox Jackson had a mortal fear of thunder and lightning. Literally, when that would happen, she would go to her bed ill. But one day, she had a revelation. One day, while the lightning and thundering was outside her window, she said, in this moment of despair, the cloud bursted, the heavens was clear, and the mountain was gone. And I rose from my knees, ran down the stairs, opened the door to let the lightning into the house. At every clap of thunder, I leapt from the floor, praising my God of my salvation. Now, what happened after this experience for her? She started experiencing mystical visions. This was a watershed event in her life. She found the presence of a divine inner voice that instructed her to use her spiritual gifts. So she wanted to preach. Same kind of an AME church. They were reticent. Bishop Allen said, let her alone now. Let her preach. She wanted to read and write. Her husband didn't want to teach her. She kicked his keister to the curb. <laughs> she divorced him. And it was years later that she met her partner, Rebecca Perot. And this would become her companion for life. Both women had visions of each other. Both women dreamed of one another. Rebecca Perot said that I dreamed that Jackson uh, was crowned king and me crowned queen of Africa. And Jackson also saw the two of them uniting in the covenant. The two men, the two women rather, were together for the 35 years until Jackson's death. Now the interesting thing about the AME church, oh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is you saw black shakers. Actually, Rebecca Cox Jackson left the AME church and went to the shaking Quakers, Anna Lee, a white preacher outside of Philadelphia welcomed her in, and it was Rebecca Cox Jackson who started the Black Shakers. And what they would do is they would start their services with quiet, with silent meditation. And then they'd begin rocking and shaking and be uplifted in the spirit. Jackson thought that her reason for being here on the planet at that time was to reject the patriarchal traditions of the churches and recover the female aspect of the divine. And she prayed this prayer. I know thee by revelation, O thou mother, thou spirit of wisdom. I was begotten to thee and brought forth. Oh, how I love thee, my mother. Well, we know even in modern times in some churches, if you say father, mother, God. I mean, think about this 30 or 40 years ago for some of you old enough. When people started saying father, mother, God in mainstream churches. Well, that just didn't sit very well, did it? Maybe not in a unity church. It was different in unity churches. But in mainstream churches, it still makes folks a little uncomfortable. And you have to realize that back in those days, white mainstream Christian churches basically did not ordain female ministers. The first one was ordained in 1850, but it wasn't until the 20th century that women were in the pulpit and were ordained. But there was one movement in America that did welcome in white female ministers, the spiritualists. Now, some of you have probably heard of spiritualism. There's a spiritualist church to this day in Norfolk. And of course, they're known at the core of their theology. Spiritualism believed that you're responsible for your actions. You need to right your wrongs and that any individual can communicate directly with God. 
course, they're probably better known for the fact that they would hold seances because they believed that the soul was eternal. And once you died, it didn't mean that your soul was dead. So they conducted seances, and of course, with that came a lot of controversy. The people you see here are some of the early spiritualists in America. The Fox sisters up on the left-hand side heard rappings and then said that they were talking to spirits and then recanted and then changed their minds again. So that's kind of an odd history. But based on that criticism, the spiritualist church actually started becoming much more focused. And so people like Anthony Jackson Davis, the man you see there in the center, and Cora Scott began to go out and preach. In fact, Cora Scott at 15 was making public appearances in which she spoke with supernatural eloquence. The thing about these folks, uh, and, and also, yes, Cora Scott would speak with supernatural eloquence because she was actually channeling the messages while she would give her, her, her preachings on a Sunday. And contemporary audiences, audiences found that the spectacle itself was incredible. A very young and pretty girl declaimed with authority on esoteric subjects. And the one thing about spiritualists, they were egalitarian. In other words, again, for white women who wanted to preach and were being blocked in churches, they could rise to the head of leadership in a spiritualist church. Now, what time is it? Oh, it's time for a pop quiz. <laughs> now, this is very simple. There's only, it's a, it, it, basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's only two choices that you're going to have here. So you have a 50% chance of being right. And then there's extra credit after that. So let me ask this question to you, see what your answer is. Who got the right to vote first in America? A, women, B, black men. B, okay, Lee, Lee, uh, tell that young man, Lee Pennypacker, what he won. Uh, yes, uh, Lee and many others of you were right. Black men actually received the right to vote long before women of any color. How many more years would it take for women to get the right to vote? There's extra credit here. Who said 50? Oh, you've got under your seat, you've got a free trip to Orlando. I'm telling you right there. <laughs> right to the year, exactly, 50 years. It took them 50 more years. And it never would have happened without this woman right here. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, some of you have heard her name. So this woman was raised, I mean, she wasn't a minister or a preacher, but she certainly could have been if she had wanted to be. Raised in a wealthy Presbyterian household, kind of conventional, but even at an early age, she started showing some proclivities that made her parents wonder. She didn't like a lot of the things in the Bible. She felt it was a little too male-oriented. So as a young woman, a young teen, she did something like what Thomas Jefferson did. I, I talked about this once here. Thomas Jefferson actually cut up the Bible, made his own Bible. It was called the Jefferson's Bible. Elizabeth Cady Stanton takes the Bible out and starts taking all the segments that deal with women, including in Proverbs. Dawn Bennett, thank you for telling me this this week about you know, relating to God as she in Proverbs. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton takes out all of these passages about women, puts them on a large canvas, and then started putting some notes in the margins about all of these passages. But being raised a Presbyterian, she was also under the influence, if you will, of the evangelical fervor at that time in her life. So there were the, so it was a second great awakening, and there were these tent revivals, and people were on fire for Jesus, and you, you'd come out, and there would be hundreds, not maybe thousands of people. And the leader of those, resival, those, recite, those revivals <laughs> at the very top of the pyramid was a guy by the name of Charles Grandison Finney. And so she went to one of his revivals for six weeks. And, but something was not clicking. So she said to Finney, if you should tell me to go to the top of the church steeple and jump off, I would readily do it, but I do not know how to go to Jesus. So he told her, you are a sinner, you need to repent from your sins, and you need to convert. But those ideas, she writes in her biography, Finney's ideas about sin and guilt were so alarming that fear and judgment seized my soul. So she looked for other solutions. 
And where Elizabeth Cady Stanton channeled her energy was in equality for women. So, but not only equality for women, she was an abolitionist. She wanted to end slavery. She wanted to get women the right to vote. Black men could vote. White men could vote. Why couldn't women vote? She said they should be able to own property. Back in those days, if you looked in the law, uh, law dictionary, once a woman got married, all of her possessions, all of her being were subsumed into the man. So it's hard to, especially for the younger generation, it's probably hard to hear these words, but she wanted women to be able to own their own property. She wanted people, women to be able to, to divorce unilaterally, not get permission from the guy she wanted to leave. She even wanted women to be able to ride bicycles, which they couldn't do in some states. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton moved forward. Oh, this is also kind of an interesting story. So she marries... A, a, an abolitionist, a guy who really wants to end slavery, and she loved him very much, but when it came time to exchange marriage vows, she made sure she removed to obey. <laughs> Out. In 1895, she wrote the Woman's Bible with her daughter, Harriet Stanton, uh, Stanton Blatch, and in that book, she criticized the ways religion portrays women as less than men, she argued that the Bible taught the subjugation and degradation of women and that equality demanded a revision and its lessons. Now, this created controversy. There was even pushback among other suffragettes. But thanks to the controversy, the book became a bestseller. Now, who stood on Emily Cady Stanton's shoulders? We've all heard of Mary Baker Eddy, right? Christian science. Very interesting background, very interesting story about this woman. She was turned on to what they called mind cure back in the 19th century. This is kind of at the roots of new thought, as Reverend Richard was talking about a few weeks ago, about the whole notion that your entire life, really, your life, your healing, your joy, your happiness, really is based on the thoughts that you have in your head and how you use those thoughts. And Mary Baker Eddy tied right into this. And she became the first woman in America to head a major church. For a season, Christian science became the ultimate new thought or mind cure church. However, Mary Baker Eddy also had some controversy about her. She was the Alpha and the Omega. Those tablets she brought back from the mountain, they were the ones that she had written. <laughs> she was basically the prophet and savior of Christian science. Mark Twain said about her in 1900, she's probably the most famous woman in America, but she's definitely the most controversial. That's why even today, New Thought and Christian Science don't really think that they're playing necessarily on the same team, even though some of their roots are the same. But make no mistake, Mary Baker Eddy was a force of nature. She started a major church, and today the Christian Science Monitor still survives, and there are some 2,000 Christian Science reading rooms around the nation. We all know this person. Whoops, went too fast. There we go. This is a face that we recognize. This is in her earlier days, Myrtle Fillmore. Of course, we know that Myrtle and her husband Charles started Unity. And basically, you know, Myrtle was also influenced. You talk about standing on the shoulders. And again, Mary Baker Eddy had some controversy about her, but you talk about standing on the shoulders. People who left Christian science were the folks that Myrtle Fillmore and Charles Fillmore listened to. Emma Curtis Hopkins might be a name that some of you recognize, but that's where Myrtle demonstrated the power of new thought and of mind cure. Because you know, she, many of you know this story, she had contracted tuberculosis. And in those days, once you contracted per tuberculosis, your next step was to a sanitarium, the next step was to the cemetery. It was an absolute death sentence. But of course, she used the power of her mind and of her spirit, not only to get well, but also starting unity, which again, Charles and Myrtle did not want to start a church at first. They wanted a spiritual path, but nevertheless, that's what happened, and they started it in Lee Summit, Missouri. Myrtle uh, wrote in one of her books, her most treasured book was by Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great writer and transcendentalist. 
And here's what Emerson said, as my page just flipped on me, but let me get this quote right down to the letter. This is what Ralph Waldo Emerson said about women. They are not only wise themselves, they make us wise. No one can be a master in conversation who has not learned much from women. This is the consciousness that Myrtle Fillmore brought forward into her adult years as a teacher, and later as she engaged in the feminist theology that today we know as New Thought. And, you know, Reverend Richard said this to me a few weeks ago. I didn't even know this. The very first class, the very first class of ministers that Unity taught and we're going to send out into the world, each and every one was a woman. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff for, those, for that time. And of course, because of those influences of these women, these shoulders that we've stood upon, we see a number of female preachers, ministers in the 20th and 21st century. Johnny Coleman, the first African-American uh, preacher, teacher, minister for unity, who actually, when she was being schooled as a minister, could not even stay on the campus of unity in Missouri at that time. I believe it was in the 1940s. I'm not really sure. You talk about breaking through glass ceiling after glass ceiling. In fact, one time when she got to Unity, and I think, I think it was Johnny Coleman, when black students were not allowed to stay on the ground, she basically put everybody in a bus and left. Now, she came back again. She came back again and became a venerated teacher, but there are others as well. Uh, Terry Cole Whitaker with Religious Science, Joyce Meyer, more mainstream, Juanita Byron, and, and of course, even Marianne Williamson for a few years. Maybe some of you don't know this. She was actually a minister at a church in Michigan called Renaissance Unity. So, how many of you would like to step out on the thin, skinny branches with me this morning? Ready? For, okay, good. All right, he's in. Ed's in. That's good. All right. Remember this date? It goes back a little over 10 years ago. December 21st, 2012. The phenomenon known as 2012, the solstice of 2012. Well, by that date, that date, of course, the world was going to end, right? They made disaster films about it. This is the end. The Mayan calendar says it all ends here. Then, of course, December 21st came and went, and everyone said it was much ado about nothing. However, take a look at this picture. You see that this is the Milky Way, and in the center, if you, I don't know, it's hard to see today. You might have to look at the monitor back there. I can see it plainly, looking in the monitor. But here's the situation. You see that dark hole, if you will, in the center? That was known as the dark rift of the Milky Way. But what was happening was that our Earth and our Sun, our solar system, was returning after a 26,000-year cycle to the center of that dark rift. And that dark rift was also called the universal womb or the sight of the divine feminine in our galaxy. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I know a lot of learned individuals from Jean Houston, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Greg Braden, Peter Russell, many others, felt that this date had more to do with our transition and where we were moving to in the next century. And for them, they believe the end of the Mayan calendar marked the return of the divine feminine, the God-Goddess polarity is one pairing that we haven't seen much in mainstream religion in this nation, certainly not in the few thousand, last few thousand years, at least not, again, in Western civilization, and certainly not as part of or an integral part of our faith systems here in the United States. But nonetheless, in polarity consciousness, it's not possible to perceive God without accepting the existence of the goddess. And this is becoming the truth for a whole lot of people now. Imagine saying, what do you prefer, to inhale or exhale? <laughs> do you prefer the God, do you prefer God or goddess? So let me ask a question that many of you would probably find silly, at least here at a Unity Center. Is God a man or a woman? Is your soul male or female? We realize as we're moving forward that there is an energy between the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. And until that marriage takes place in all of us, we as a nation, we as a people, we as a center will not evolve. We know that they are both integral in both of them. 
And what's interesting is this. Who's coming next? A man? A woman? I mean, when Paula stood on this dais, she could be open. She was vulnerable. She shed tears from up here. But Paula could also be steely. She could be strong. She could be direct. She was a business person. Sometimes she wasn't to be, she wasn't to be messed with, right? <laughs> there was a great balance there. Maybe that's one of the reasons we love Paula so much. Maybe that's what we are calling to us next. So will it be a man or a woman? I don't know. I do know that we live in an age where people are more openly expressing their masculine and their feminine energies. Look what's happened in the LGBT community over the last 50 years. Coming out to be who they are. Look what's happening with young people and transgender. People who are identifying with which sex they choose. In other words, it's becoming perhaps more amorphous, but in a way that calls upon the inner divinity of the masculine and feminine aspects of our soul. Now, I know in some states, they're saying, don't say gay. <laughs> let's, let's pull the books off the shelves. But what is the fear? What, was, what is the fear there? Is it the fear of the end of patriarchy? Is it the end of religious control? I would say this. The goddess is in charge. The divine feminine is coming back. She's not ticked off. She's coming back with love and dynamism, strength and nurturing. She's coming back with a full heart. And in that sense, our new minister will reflect the positive aspects of both the divine masculine and the divine feminine and will surely keep Unity Renaissance in good hands. Let's go ahead and go into meditation. <laughs> In this, in this meditation, <clears throat> we dedicate it to everyone in the room today. We dedicate it to those watching online. And I dedicate it specifically for the divine feminine in my life, my life partner, Valerie. So let's feel that energy in our heart, that place where the divine masculine and divine feminine reside. Let us be at peace with that. Let us breathe through our hearts. Breathing more deeply and slowly as this energy fills us. We know that our souls are eternal. We know that they are neither masculine nor feminine. They are both masculine and feminine. We know we are called to this lifetime to fully express our divinity, and that is the divine feminine and divine masculine, and has always been a part of unity and new thought and conscious awareness. We feel the gratitude now for this consciousness. We feel the gratitude for this love. And now for a moment or three, let us reside in our hearts. Let us reside in this love. So it is.
your unfolding peace show. Spirit show through me as I open up to be an expression of your unfolding.